Assalamu alaikum fam. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, chapter 12 of religion. We're continuing. Let's begin. The first two make anxiety for being assured that there be causes of all things that have hitherto to or shall arrive hereafter. It is impossible for a man who continually endeavoureth to secure himself against the evil he fears and procure the good he desireth. So here, what is he saying? Have arrived hitherto, too, so it's really in front of you, right? You got to that point. So he's saying that it's quite difficult for someone to continually strive to find full security to the point where the good is at its pinnacle, right? You will not be able to have yourself so secure that you no longer fear evil, right? This is something very, very interesting that he's getting at here for us. Because as Muslims, it can remind us of paradise. It can remind us of what this earth is. Remember, he has a very harsh view of earth, which he's not entirely wrong for thinking. Not to be in a perpetual solitude of the time to come, so that every man, especially those that are over provident, are in an estate to like that of Prometheus. Now, this is interesting. He brings up Prometheus, the light bearer, who brought in Greek mythology a torch of light to man. And he brought a good fire is both good and bad, right? Because you are able to heat and cook your food, but you're also able to have gunpowder, burn things down. You know, it can get pretty chaotic as well. And the punishment for Prometheus in Greek mythology was every night he would have his liver pecked out by a giant bird. And he would feel it and then it would grow back and only to be re in the next day. Uh, and one of the punishments, remember we read in Hellfire, for some in the Hadith that were there, the narration said that your skin will grow back uh, repeatedly in the Hellfire. So think of that. Uh, in a very similar way. For as Prometheus, which is interpreted as the prudent man. Now, I don't really think Prometheus as a prudent man. He, prudent is what's expedient. Fire is expedient to get cooking done to kill germs and such. But at the same time, you must wonder. Was bound to the hill of Caucasus. So this is what's really interesting. The hill of the Caucasus, the Caucasus Mountains, where the Caucasians are from. It's quite interesting to think of uh, Prometheus being from there. A place of large prospect. So the Caucasus Mountains having prospect, meaning lots of possibilities, right? A prospector comes through the land and he checks it out and he says, like, what you can build there. What's the potential of the terrain in which you are residing or want to reside in? An eagle feeding on his liver, devoured in the day as much as he was repaid in the night. So that man which looks too far before him in the care of future time, hath his heart all the day long gnawed on by the fear of death, poverty, or other calamity. Now this is interesting. Future time, gnawed on. So that is more gruesome, right? So that eagle, that giant bird is definitely gnawing on Prometheus's liver. The fear of death that Prometheus would fear is, is interesting because you wonder if the character Prometheus would have just gotten used to it. He knows the pain is coming so you know he I don't think the myth implies he dies every night rather he lives through it just to endure the pain the next day. So it's interesting Hobbes has a different view. Poverty? Well, mm, Prometheus is stuck to a rock. You know what I mean? He's not really going to be able to go about his business as normal. Other calamity? Uh, well, he has only one, which is that, which is a great calamity, right? It's quite awful. So I don't know. And has no repose. Well, definitely Prometheus didn't have any repose. But I see how he's trying to compare Prometheus archetype with the common man, the prudent essence and such for us, nor pause of his anxiety but in sleep. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. 
Prometheus only gets a pause when he's asleep. Yeah, well, that's pretty true. You know, because when he wakes up, he sees that bird flying over. He knows what's up. He knows what's going to happen. This perpetual fear, yeah, so that, that's a good point right there. So Prometheus, when you think of him, you can think of also perpetual fear. He helped out mankind, also brought them a, vi a vice as well, against uh, Zeus's wishes, because Zeus didn't want man to have that at that time, and Hephaestus, the one who makes the thunderbolts for Zeus, the weapons, essentially, of all the gods on Mount Olympus. Polytheism is a bit, polytheism is a bit ridiculous. But that's just the lore behind it. Uh, Prometheus took it, you know? So he gave it, and then look what humans have done to each other is how they view it, right? Because remember, he's probably bringing up Prometheus for us because in a time of war, this is going to be something that is going to be quite evident. Weapons of war, a lot of them engage with fire, gunpowder, firepowder, people torching each other's villages. The fire element is very apparent in times of war. Very apparent. I mean, fire has helped win wars, right? Especially for the Chinese. Always accompanying mankind in the ignorance of causes, as it were in the dark. Must needs have for object something, and therefore, when there is nothing to be seen, there is nothing to accuse. That is interesting. When there is nothing to be seen, there is nothing to accuse. That's a very clever tactic right there. If you don't make something apparent, no one can then use it against you in the same sense. But today, people can just make things up. Either of their good or evil fortune, but some power or agent invisible. So here he's getting at God's figure. Power and agent invisible. Right? And then the agent invisible is an interesting way to put it because people ask for signs of God whether, you know, you cannot see God directly, but you can see the signs and evidences of God's creation hinting at the aspect of a created reality. So this is going back to the very tense conversation people were having back then as today of where is God, right? What is God? And how would you describe God without saying the word God, right? It's very interesting. In which sense, perhaps it was that some of the old poets said that the gods were at first created by human fear. Now here he's getting at the polytheist view. Um, again, the poets are a huge figure in, in human societies, human history. It's really fascinating because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you know, made sure that the Quran was not classified as poetry. Some poets were punished for their satirical stuff and what they did. Uh, you know, it's really f quite fascinating how even for Hobbes, he's saying the common repeated phrase that, you know, poets create religion through their beautification of rhetoric. But it's like, hmm, you know, uh, it's not just human fear. See, this is a, a thing by the atheists say that and I mean, I say it sometimes to people, the common phrase of there's no atheist in a foxhole. A foxhole is, a, is like a trench. It's like a hole that you are in. You're about to die. You call out to God. This has been something that atheist scientists and spiritual religious leaders have gone head to head for, you know, thousands of years. Uh, the scientists of those days who were secret atheists, modern ones today, who say if you don't have fear you wouldn't think to look for a god but rather i take the reverse side of you should fear god and know that evil itself need not always be feared but you should fear the wrath of god and there's superstitions but when you actually fear only god alone the other fears become minor this is what's interesting you're still cautious right you're still cautious you're not reckless rather you turn to allah alone when you're in a time of deep fear and tribulation, right? You have a steadfast patience that occurs. Rather than being a, a frantic, afraid bunny rabbit hiding in every hole, as some atheists tried to make, you know, a caricature of that type of energy. It's really interesting. He's getting at something that many have spoken of. Which spoken of the gods, that is to say of God, eternal, infinite, and omnipotent. You've heard those 
before. We know for Allah Sawajal, He's the most high in might, full dominion, will never die, was never born, and will never cease to existing. May more easily be derived from the desire of men have to know the causes of all natural bodies. So he now he says that God comes from wanting to know the causes of natural things. Like why is it here? Why did this happen? So now he's mentioned fear for us and causes. So that's getting at more and more of like why he thinks humans believe in God. Fear and cause is what he's saying. For he that from any effect he seeth come to pass should reason to the next and immediate cause thereof. So what is he saying there? That he sees an effect and he saw what happened. So he's going to try to reason what's going to be the next thing that's going to cause that or come from that. Which is just a point of human psychology for us, right? You know, he's not entirely wrong. It's kind of what makes us inquisitory. It makes us different. It makes us better than, you know, the chimpanzees and bonobos. And from thence to, to the cause of that cause and the plong himself profoundly in the pursuit of causes. So plong himself profoundly in the pursuit of causes. So pursuit of causes. So he wants to go to the cause and everyone would know that they would go to the first cause. And then a cynical habanero. Can you close the door or the bar? Thank you. So you would go and then go to the first cause, which would be God. And then a sassy person would say, oh, well, who created God? And who created the guy who created God? And you're like, no one can really know that. So you need to just stop, right? You're Now you're being ridiculous. Because you could say to an atheist, well, what was before the Big Bang? And what was before the thing that created the Big Bang? And, the Big Bang? and you could do that too. And they would say, I don't know. But they would frame it as, we're more sophisticated for not knowing than you for not knowing who created God. Do you see what I'm saying? So they have that kind of rhetoric trick that they do. But he is right that we would uh, want to investigate what came to pass. We would use our reason to see the causes of it. And then we would go on a search of that. It's the reasoning process that we've been given by Allah. So would y'all, I'd argue. Shall at last come to this that there must be as even the heathen philosophers confess one first mover exactly so the first mover another Aquinas uh, phrase that is a first and an eternal cause of all things which is that which men mean by the name of God so exactly so here you get at what do people mean when they say God right it means a lot of different things to other people but he narrowed it down Eternal cause of all things, first mover. And this is without thought of their fortune, the solicitude whereof both inclines to fear and hinders them from the search of the causes of other things. Now, this is not fair. Inclines them to fear. <laughs> Maybe for the polytheists, right, of the Greeks. They got to make all these weird sacrifices. They got these naughty deities who are heavily immoral, right? Hera one of Zeus's wives, a total evil woman, just totally evil. She persecuted Heracles, Hercules, because Zeus had cheated on her with another one, and Her Hercules, Heracles, was essentially a bastard. He was a bastard baby. And she punished him and made him do his 12 labors. She was a complete psychopath, right? So no doubt the followers of Hera deeply feared her and were like, more of like we gotta appease these crazy deities but for us Muslims I'd argue it's it's not the same type of fear it is fear but it's out of the awe and the majesty and the hope of forgiveness and that fear compels you to not do bad things instead of you know a deity arbitrarily punishing you because they're fickle right Allah for us is the most just. Hera and the Greek gods, they're have not they're not just. They will they can be bribed, they can change their mind, they can even be attracted to the human forms, right? You the more you study their weirdness, you're like, this makes zero sense, right? 
But if you compare the morality of the polytheists, especially the Greek faith, to that of Islam, you would see it's quite, quite different. So when he says, you know, inclines to fear, and that it stops you from searching for other things, I would say no, this the searching becomes more fine-tuned to where you begin to notice the signs of God's creation, how this earth is a stomping ground where you will be tested, tried, and made stronger, and learning the great craft and ability of fortified patience, where you will witness things, and where you will earn your place in paradise and earn a nice accounting on Judgment Day, right? So we'll look for the searches and the cause, but we do know that some things don't always need the explanation behind them. You just don't do it, right? Because you can see with common sense and as some strong Iman faith that you best not engage in that activity. And this must have caused that, you know, there's only so much time in a day, so you need not inquire into certain things that are just beyond the point if it's not going to be your specialization, right? It is quite interesting, his opinion. And thereby give an occasion of finding of as many gods as their men may find them. See, here he's making a jab at polytheism, right? This is this is a, this is part of the point of the ridiculousness of polytheism. So occasion of feigning, occasion of feigning means like their whims, their desires, whatever they feel. They're leaning this way. There's oh, there's one in the tree. There's one on the rock. There's one on the river. There's one on the mountain. There's one on the volcano. Like whatever they seem to think is the cause of something, they're going to engage in that and worship it. It's absolutely ridiculous. Very very absurd. I would tell Hobbes if he was alive today, let's sit down and have a little bit of dawa, right? Our creator is one. You need not go around being freaked out and inclining to any type of deity that, you know, is completely insane, right? But he did mention the heathen philosophers and how there's a first mover. If you're at the first mover, that's a singular, right? It's not the first movers, no, one, right? So just this solid type of numerical code going on here. It's really quite interesting. What do you think, fam? I mean, he's got some interesting points. Agent, invisible, some power, God eternal, infinite, omnipotent, first mover, eternal cause, you know, pursuit of causes, mentioned Prometheus, the prudent man, he has a lot going on here. Mentions the poets. What do you think? What do you think?